solve large intractable problems. It's a new venture altogether. Your brain is a wild horse there. Because remember, writing is not a team sport. You are not selling horse carriages when there are cars. I want to be known only as a trusted advisor. More like a tourist. Play to Potential Podcast. Let's talk about that, Raghu. Uh, I was going to get to that. You talk about the notion of counterpoints in the book. For every right. Pandava archetype, there's there's a, there is a counterpoint, counterpoint. in the Kauravas. In the Kauravas. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, in the book you talk about Bhima and Duryodhana, Yudhishthira and uh, Bhishma, Bhishma on the other side, Arjuna and Karna Correct. on the other side, Nakula and Gandhari on the other side, and Sahadeva and Shakuni on the other side. Correct. So can you just shine the light on just the distinction between these two? And, uh, you know, uh, how they end up on, on different sides. Uh, oh. Yeah, see, if you look at uh, the essential character of Yudhishthira, na, this is a person who will use his psyche, his everything, to respond to order and see how the situation is orderly, disorderly, and bring it back to order. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's even a very interesting discussion at the end of the war on the 18th day. Who should lead the war? Mm -hmm. Should Bhima lead the war or Yudhishthira lead the war? Right? Because it has to be a decisive battle. So they go to Krishna because they can't resolve this question. So Krishna says Yudhishthira has to lead the war because Bhima will escalate the war. He will not know how to fight in a way that you can bring peace right. at the end of the war. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is brilliant, right? So the Yudhishthira's power lies in going into areas of chaos and bringing an order, mm. right? You take uh, Bhishma. He is also a person with great knowledge, wants to create order, but he's so rigid about it that he cannot respond to the context. Yeah, so when the Draupadi Vastraharan is happening, Right. He is the final arbiter of truth. He's the one who has the power. He simply isn't willing to say that rules are rigid. Dharma is not following the rules. Mm -hmm. Right. So he ends up in the Kaurava side. Right. You take Nakula. Mm -hmm. Right. He's serving. You hardly hear about him. The whole of the Mahabharata. Mm -hmm. Right? But he's always there in every scene. He's mentioned, but there's nothing much mentioned about him because he's setting the context. Mm. He sacrificed himself completely for the context. Right? You take what Gandhari has done. Right? She's gone into a situation which is terrible. Right? She's betrayed. Her husband is blind and all that, fine. But if I want to serve, will I blind myself also or will I be the eyes? Mm. Right. So in the idea of service that Gandhari brings in, there are lots of very, very, you know, nice things. But she has self-sacrificed herself to the detriment mm -hmm. of the context. Mm. Right. You take Shakuni and Sahadeva. Right. And it's interesting. In many of the battles, these are the people who have to fight and kill each other. Mm. Yeah. One of them, only one of them can survive. In the, in the Mahabharata battle. So you have this, uh, you know, intelligent person, right, who can see, who has forethought, who has foresight, right? And the way Sahadeva uses foresight and the way Shakuni uses foresight, mm. they're the counterpoints. So that's the brilliance of the Mahabharata, na? So it tells you in different contexts how a dharmic mind of a certain archetype will act and how the same archetype, if it awakens an adharmic motivation, how they will act mm -hmm. and how this will lead inevitably to a confrontation which is destructive. Mm. And back to the Pandava archetypes, uh, Raghu, you also say that uh, each of these archetypes have a, have a shadow side. That's right. So can you talk a little bit about 
how uh, we think yeah. about that and how we manage that. Yeah, see, the most famous uh, scene in the Mahabharata is Draupadi's Vatsraharana. Right? And what is happening there? Now, just imagine yourself as, you know, like this Bhishma Yudhishthira archetype, you know, always doing the right thing, whatever. But you're human. Right? There's a part of you that will rebel against this kind of, you know, rigid, keeping aside my feelings, keeping aside my intuitions, keeping aside my mm -hmm. passion and doing the right thing. Right? So what happens to that energy? You keep pushing it, you keep pushing it. Right? So here you have Shakuni who's understood this. So he's seen your shadow. So he tempts you. Mm -hmm. And you as Yudhishthira give the most exalted reasons to actually gamble. <laughs> That's the shadow side of you. Right? And these are related. So this side would like to play. It would like to just say, damn the rules, damn order, damn what's right and wrong. Just let me go. Yeah. Now, these sides are there in all the Pandavas. Because every one of them, at some point or the, of time or the other, screws up. They make a mistake. Mm. Now, the fundamental difference between the Pandavas and the Kauravas is every time they make a mistake, the Pandavas go into a period of Ajnatavasa. Mm. They go into retreat. And they ask themselves, in doing what I was doing, what was I really doing? Where did it come from? Mm. Right? And then they go and meet sages. They do tapas. It's all described, na? how they work with it and how they work with themselves. And it's very interesting because especially after this uh, gambling scene in the Ajnata Vasa, when they go into the exile, they meet uh, sages who tell them stories about other people who did something similar and how they came out of it. Mm, fascinating. Right? And at the end of that, the actual Ajnata Vasa period, when they become exiles to themselves, mm. Right? Is a fascinating story. Each of them, there's actually a, a discussion before they go in to Virata, where they ask who will we be, how will we not be recognized Disguise. at all. Yeah. Yeah. Disguise. So uh, it is described like this, now that Yudhishthira smiles and says, I will go as the gambling companion to the king. Mm -hmm. Right? So these shadow sides, which are my strangers, unto myself, in a sense, have to be met, have to be understood fully. So they have to live with it for one year, right? And these are five people who've always been kings. They have to be servants. Mm. They've always been together. They have to be completely alone. So they have to go and explore parts of themselves that have never been touched. And unless you understand this, you know, imagine that, that I'm a leader who has not worked with my shadow selves, mm. right? What will I do with my power when the context triggers the shadow, triggers the compulsive parts of me? Mm. They'll just come out. And I will use my power to justify it. I'll use it to cover it up, mm. right? And it's a disaster. Right? We've seen leaders, na? national leaders and so on, who have just been rampant mm. with power. They have not worked with their shadows. Right? So the Mahabharata makes it very, very clear. Unless you have really, really worked with your shadow, you cannot enter a dharmic war. Mm. Now, bringing that to, let's say, contemporary uh, business life, Raghu, mm -hmm. what, what, what would uh, the equivalent of an Agya, Agyatavasa mean? Uh, would that mean... Why to a meditation retreat? Would it be something else? Yeah. No, going into Ajnata Vasa in a current context would mean two things for me. I mean, most of the you know, CEOs I've coached also, this, is, this has been my advice. Mm -hmm. One is, um, see, most people who come to a CEO level and very senior levels are fundamentally intelligent people and they also have an ability to look at themselves. It's not as though they are, don't have that ability. But when you get 
these uh, compulsions and the shadows opened up, they overpower you. They're more powerful than you. Right? So there are two, three things that are necessary. One, you have to have a daily practice where you set aside time to sit back and ask fundamental questions of yourself. Mm. Yeah, I call it the Arjuna time. Mm. Right? Every leader must set that aside and ask very deep questions. Right? Plus health and whatever. That's a separate thing. The other thing is it is necessary to go on a retreat every now and again, to really pull out of what you're doing, right? And go and do something that will really help you to touch parts of yourself that lie completely hidden in your normal everyday life. Yeah? Uh, the other is to read, to read books like Mahabharata. Of course. Right? Not to read the usual thing that says, this is how you have to be a leader, that's how you have to be a leader. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but to read a wide variety of things. So it, you know, it allows you to uh, reflect off your thinking and so on. And also do thought experiments. Mm-hmm. Right? Take up a situation and do a complete thought experiment. Yeah, different triggers will come up, right? So you take the thought experiment fully. Yeah, there are texts like the, there's a text called the Tripura Rahasya mm-hmm. in which the wife coaches the husband how to be a good king. Yeah. Isn't that true in all houses? <laughs> just uh, but this, this is an old book that tells you exactly how to do it. Yeah. And one of the things that is done is this whole thing of, you know, this guy has taken on a few complete thought experiments mm-hmm where he lives one life out, he lives another life out and all that, to understand fully. And I don't know if you've read the book, Herman Hesse's Siddhartha. Uh There also, there are these things, where he uses this thought experiment thing fully. Yeah, so, but it requires courage, Mm. right? And why a coach becomes useful is because when you do these by yourself, your mind can play tricks on you. And when you have to really look at the difficult parts of yourself, you'll quietly do a, Mm. you know, an escape trick and think that you've got the logic. 